Welcome back, pet parents. Today's episode is a little bit different, but still so, so valuable. I have an incredible uh, veterinarian. She is currently retired from practice, but what she is doing now is, in my opinion, it could even be more important. So Dr. Can I still call you doctor? Is that okay or no? Of course, I'm still always a vet. I'm just not licensed anymore. I don't do it. Doctor. Yes. <laughs> Kathy Alanovi. I'm so excited to have you here. And I want to learn a bit, little bit about you, um, a little bit about your journey into a more, you know, holistic mindset because we all know, like we all if we have pets, we have had some interaction with a veterinarian at some point in our lives. And sadly, so many of us have had not so great interactions with veterinarians at some point in our lives. So I'm just curious, can you tell me a little bit about you, how you got started in veterinary medicine? I always like those, by the way, like what made you want to be a vet? Maybe we should start there. Uh, okay. I have, I have a dark secret. Do you know why most of us veterinarians are veterinarians? I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot of different stories, um, but no, it, no, those are individual stories. The always, whole group, we don't like no. humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. And so, as a kid, my sibling, my brother, was the dog because you know my mom was going to graduate school and working and stuff. So my brother was the dog. And who did I come home to? It was talk to the dog. And, you know, we'd move. And who did I have? I had the dog. I loved animals. And so I can understand and relate to animals. And they don't teach us that every dog or cat must come with a human attached. <laughs> so, so individual reasons aside, but the truth is most of us don't really like people very much. <laughs> That's, you know, what's so funny about that is because... I, and I didn't tell you this, I actually started out, well, no, if I go way back, I started out doing TNR with cats, feral cat okay. colonies. Okay. But when I really, really got serious about like, you know, being online and having an online presence, I became a positive reinforcement dog trainer. And that was kind of my reason too. I was like, I want to work with dogs. I am so tired of working with people. I'm so tired of dealing with people. I want to work with dogs. And then like, that quickly, it was like, oh, right. right. <laughs> Right, exactly, because 90% of dog training is human training. Absolutely. <laughs> it is, yes. Right. It's so funny. It's training us humans how to be positive with our dogs. Yeah. It's crazy. So, yes, I, I like people a little bit better now, usually. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's how it started. I've always wanted to be a vet. It kind of, it took me a little while um, I went and played in the Air Force for eight years after college. And then I went back to vet school. Well, and thank you for your for service, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So so here I am. And why did I turn? So now I'm this. I joke with people because I, I was like, okay, now it's time for voodoo. Because um, <laughs> I just don't do Western medicine anymore. People either come to me with a diagnosis or we need to do voodoo. Yeah. And, it, you know, and it, it's this, it's this muscle testing thing. It's a different yeah. talk, but it all started from clients. I had clients who had problems I couldn't fix with, with what basic veterinary medicine taught us. And it was a dog and a horse who were both limping. I knew where the problem was. Medicine didn't work. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe you need a chiropractor. I didn't go to a chiropractor, but then I, they're like, well, where did you go? So I did. And then I met somebody who talked about, um, what do you call it? Animal communication. Yeah. It's... If you had told me in vet school that something like animal communication existed, I wouldn't have believed you. And now it's real, you know, energy, mm -hmm. it's real. And so call it voodoo, call it weird, whatever, but whatever it takes to make these guys better, let's do it. It's awesome. Yes. Okay. So I am totally into muscle testing. I haven't been able to figure out how to 
do it for my animals yet, but I am I'm teaching myself tarot, so like I sway test my tarot cards every morning. <laughs> okay. So sway test. Okay, so it's the same thing. Yeah. Once you're centered and you're sway testing yourself, now you just change who you're thinking about and you think about your dog or your cat or your yeah. child or your spouse or your friend. It's believe in yourself. Right. Which actually is really hard for a lot of people to do. It's hard because our society doesn't support that simply because mm -hmm. mainstream medicine says, give me a test, give me a test, give me a test. Yeah. But the more confident, you, you'll get good at it. Don't worry. You'll get good at it. So good. <laughs> cool. In good company. So, okay. You, you went in the Air Force. You went to vet school. And you, I assume you came out and you practiced traditional veterinary medicine for a time. And, and then you were just so over <laughs> not being able to help these pets, right? Like, that's what I'm getting. Things slowly happen. So, yeah, I graduated vet school in 2001. I actually started out as a food animal vet. Um, and then by 2008 in the recession, most of my farmers sold out. And so I was like, well, what am I going to do? And in the meantime, I had slowly started having more and more small animals because I'd take care of their dogs and cats and their horses and, and all of that. And then at the same time, then I had, or again, around 2008, I had the couple of clients with the lame horse and the lame dog. So then I had went to chiropractic training and most of the animal chiropractic training for veterinarians, it's like a 250 hour course and it's, you know, five, four day weekends and pretty heavy duty, good best neurology training I've had. Um, and at the end, one of my teachers is like, I can't tell you how to fix this, but you need to come to one of my classes. And I'm like, what the heck? So I got done with this basic chiropractic training where we learn these basic conditions and it was great foundation. And then I go the next weekend to his next class and I was like oh my goodness the pelvis does more than just this it does all this rotation and all this stuff because there's this horse with this pelvis like this and his head is like this and he's all tight and jacked up in between and that's when I learned applied kinesiology which is the muscle testing and then I applied that to western medicine so like a dog would come in, we did a little lab test and said, oh, Fluffy has a bladder infection. I'd get out 15 antibiotics and herbs and muscle test which one strengthened the bladder to try to pick the best one. And, you know, things just developed over time. And then I got more training and more education and discovered that um, my little seven pound dog who gets the same size vaccine as a 200 pound Mastiff might not be being served with that little vaccine. So you have to give the full dose of vaccine. If you don't, the state and the um, the veterinary board don't like that. So I relinquished my license. And that's when talking to Susan Thixton, she's like, you know, Kathy, now that you're not working as a Western veterinarian anymore, you should start a trade association and represent fresh pet food companies. Because by this time, I'd learned what was in the pet food, discovered that I had been selling a prescription food and that I was like charging people money and poisoning their animals. And God, talk about a guilt trip. So then I, you know, made the transition to fresh real food. And she's like, you need to represent these people. So that's how six years ago, eight, oh gosh, that's eight years ago, I started the trade association to represent fresh pet food manufacturers. So now I'm the one who sits at the AFCO table and says, well, for us in the fresh pet food industry, we really don't care if you change the name of corn gluten meal to corn protein meal because we don't use it. Yeah. <sighs> so 
So that's my story. <laughs> I think that's most of it. That's the short version. Very, uh, yeah, so, very short. So I still advise people, everything always starts with fresh food. Meanwhile, I represent the fresh pet food industry to AFCO. I set up meetings with FDA on behalf of my members, uh, you know, so politics. Yeah. But it's needed because that's, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, it is needed and more support for this is needed. Um, and to get that support, a lot of education, a lot of, I say a lot of education, but a lot of deprogramming and then education. Absolutely. <laughs> needs, needs absolutely. And it's all around. Absolutely. Yeah. From, from pet owners to vets to even the manufacturers and, mm -hmm. and yeah, lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so many interesting things you said in there. One, and I, I had, um, I've had Dr. Lori Kozier on a couple of times now and we've talked we did a whole, whole episode just on titer testing. Oh, and goodness. that was so interesting, but she is still a licensed veterinarian. So she can only say certain things. She can't like go past a certain <laughs> point. Right. And um, that, that idea that you brought up that, you know, this six pound chihuahua and this hundred pound, whatever, mastiff, St. Bernard, whatever, is right. getting the same, same dose, dose. Mm -hmm. that boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm, but honestly, with so many different things, I'm like, where is the science in this? And I'm wondering, I know you don't have an answer, but like, where is the science in this? <laughs> nice. So that good for you, because one of the things that strengthened my argument for what I was doing, because I was giving less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was 15 year old, five pound chihuahua, much less. I had read an article years ago and it was cut. It was a acupuncture western medicine article and the researcher gave 0 0.1 mls so a tenth this the standard rabies vaccine is one ml so this researcher gave a tenth of that and injected it at gv1 that's the acupuncture point between the rectum and the tail or oh. for us humans that don't have a tail <laughs> it's there <laughs> But they injected it there and they found um, the amnesty, how do you say that word? The response that you measure when you do the antibody, the titer testing. They found an antibody response and I'm like, whoa, oh, there's scientific proof that you can give less and you can get an antibody response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the licensing board doesn't like that. <laughs> right. There is science that supports it. There's, there's good science. And the veterinarians who used to publish the information, you notice I say used to because some of that information has been taken down off the website. Mm. And I understand it. In hindsight, I can tell you it's very liberating to have relinquished my license. At the time, it was humiliating, humbling. It was awful. It was a year and a half of hell because... I had wanted to be a vet since I was nine. And so it was my identity. Mm -hmm. It's now I'm on the other side and I can never give a rabies vaccine again. Yes. It's beautiful. I, I'm dependent on somebody else for that potential poison. Um, it's a good place to be because yeah. I just can say no. I just simply, sorry, I can't do that. Can't do that. Uh, but I have a lot of parents whose human children have been vaccine damaged. So it has opened their mind to, holy cow, what am I doing to my dog or my cat or my horse? Mm -hmm. The horse's kid is horrible. But mm -hmm. um, 
So, so people are starting to think about things and then they're stuck at this horrible place of, well, there's a law about yeah. rabies vaccines, but who wrote the law? Because if the yeah. law were written on science, the law would say one rabies vaccine after the 16 weeks of age, mm -hmm. and then you can check titers after right. that. Right. That would be the law. And if you want me to register my dog, okay. Here's my titers. Here's my $25 registration. Boom. Thank you. That would be science-based law mm -hmm. administration. But who funds, who funds these laws? <laughs> well, well, lobbyists. And lobbyists. who pay for our lobbyists? Mm -hmm. Pharmaceutical companies Pharmaceutical and Big companies. Ag and yeah. Uh, AVMA, so the American okay. Veterinary Medical Association, the County Veterinary Medical Association, the State Medical Association. Right. Because as veterinarians, it costs us about a dollar a dose. And, and Dr. Koger probably already talked about this. So about a dollar a dose and we charge you 50 bucks. Boom. Profit center. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, and I'm sure you can also attest to having, you know, previously been in practice that it, you're you're not becoming rich as a veterinarian, so you have to have these little things here and there that are bringing in money just to keep the doors open. <laughs> it's not because you're trying to, to get rich, generally speaking. Yes. There, there is a lot yes. of corporate medicine going on now. <laughs> there is. I had a... I had quite a philosophical conversation with a classmate of mine who out of vet school went straight into private practice and about eight to 10 years in, he was like, ah, I'm done with private practice and, and went to teach at a university. But he said, you know, because everybody has this, everybody, most <laughs> people have in their mind the idea that bigger is better bigger is better. I need to grow. I need to get big. Oh, I need to take over the whole town, that sort of thing. Who taught us that? But because of that mentality, it was really hard for me to write down the numbers and do the math because he said, he's like, Kathy, I honestly think that if you did less, had less staff, had, le had, had less overhead, you'd make more money. I couldn't wrap my head around the math. Mm -hmm. He was right. Mm -hmm. He was right. Bigger means you need to take on more people, more overhead, more liability, more foo-foo, more stuff, more inventory, all these things that cost money. You know, we're taught, and sometimes we're taught by our boss, oh, you got to keep people coming here for the pharmacy because we make really good money. You know, the markup in the pharmacy is huge. Well, people who realize that, pet owners who realize that are like, will you write me a prescription and I'll go get it from Walmart? Because Walmart does $5 prescriptions. And, and the veterinarians, man, man. But where's the focus? That it, is that the right focus? And my classmate, he was right. In hindsight, I agree with him. He was right. You don't have to have all those profit centers. You don't have all that overhead. You don't need all those profit centers. Yeah. Corporate medicine would have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Right. Well, and that's one of the biggest for, for me, like just looking at it as a pet parent, um, with, even just a little bit of knowledge and information and, and, you know, trying to empower myself to do what was best for my pets. I look at these structures that they have, like, I'll just take Banfield for an example, and you pay this monthly fee and you come in on these set days and times and you drop off your pet and they get, I don't know, five, boom, six. Boom, boom, boom. It's assembly line right. medicine. Yes. Yes. This is how we treat cattle. Which Not also isn't great, but <laughs> would you ever do that with your two-legged hairless child? I can't. You would imagine. never go to the pediatrician and say, Here you go, take my kid, I'll be back in an hour. You do what you want. 
Right. You would never. No. It's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> right. You do know who owns Banfield, right? Um, I feel like I used to, but my mind is blanking. Ours, the candy bar company. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. You know. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. Um, there, there's your wake up. Remember. Oh yes. yeah. Right. Well, and that's, I, oh, when I, it was maybe a little over a year ago, I was doing some research to, for a different podcast and it was, um, I was looking at all the, like, okay, who owns PetSmart? Who owns um, Petco? Petco at, at the time, I, I think it still is, is, was actually not a big conglomerate owned, but anyway, um, and then Banfield and all these other, you know, Vetco and all these plate, like who owns them following the money, blah, blah, blah. And I looked and the revenue that Mars brings in from all of their pet lines years ago exceeded what they made from candy. So like, even though we still think of them as like a candy company, they make a lot more money in all of their pet lines. They're, they're, they're not really a candy company. I mean, they are, but they're not like, that's not where they're honestly genius from a financial perspective. Absolutely. Family owned. It's the biggest family I've ever seen, <laughs> but they're genius from a financial perspective, but right. And so where's the health of your pet when they own, they and Purina own 75% of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so if they're feeding your animal and the ingredients in the food might not be quite the standard that we would feed our two legged kids. And then they own the veterinary hospitals and the emergency clinics and the profit from the pet food is the same as the profit from the veterinary clinic. It's genius. It's genius. Yeah. yeah. And Oh, so like to me, like in my heart, it's like so evil too. <laughs> and I, I know we shouldn't say that. Like they, you, you know, know I, it's people. interesting because, because of going to AFCO meetings, I have individually met people who work for these different companies and as individuals, they're very nice people. Yeah. Right. Their intentions, I believe honestly are altruistic they just drank the kool-aid mm -hmm. and i drank a different color of kool-aid right so you know yeah, yeah. no that it's that is one of the truest things ever like an individual can be the nicest most wonderful person in the world but when you get wrapped up into this big group think right it really can be very detrimental um so prob probably probably you know what happened, but, um, okay. So yeah. you are not practicing. You don't have your license, but you are still helping pet parents. I'm a health coach. You're a health coach, very food forward health coach. Right. I Always love that. Food. <laughs> tell me about, yes. Tell me, tell me, tell me why. Okay. Quiz question. Where in the body is 70% of the immune system? The gut. Right. I do this to people in the office. <laughs> they get this deer in the head like going, oh my goodness, I didn't know it was science class. And, and so if they, if they look really freaked out, I'm like, okay, sorry, it's science class. <laughs> but my job, and, and I have always done this, even when the only thing I knew was Western medicine. If you don't understand why X condition happens, what it means, whatever, you don't know how to make it better. You don't understand what, why all of that. So I have always been big about educating people and explaining how things work. And then I'm learning people teach me and I read more and the more I learn, the more I teach people, but so that's what I always do. My first appointments, I meet people. I understand what's going on with their animal. 
I may circle around and ask about vaccines and heartworm and flea and water and traits and all of that. But really the discussion, most of the first appointment is what are you feeding? And some people come in and they already know. And I'm like, hallelujah, you've made my life really easy. Yes and no, because if somebody comes in the first time and they're feeding just regular old kibble, I might be able to fix their animal by just convincing them to switch over to real food. And maybe not. But then if people come in and they're already feeding real food and they already understand and they're still having problems, in a way it's easier and in a way it's not. Because if mm -hmm. the problem didn't fix, it's like, ooh, we have a harder issue than it's just the food. But we always start there... And I don't really care if people feed cooked food or raw. I don't care if they make it or if they buy it. I, will, I give them resources. I ask, what do you want to do? What, why? Let me give you education. Let me teach you how to cook without overcooking. Um, and and then, then we figure out what else is left. But if 70% of the immune system's in the gut, you're never going to fix itching ears, autoimmune disease, uh, fistulas, if you don't fix the gut. Um, if the neurotransmitters, the chemicals in the gut are the same as what's in the brain, you're not going to make seizures less, anxiety less, any of that if you don't fix what's going on in the gut first. So yeah. that's why I harp. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it is the foundation. And mm -hmm. It's, um, I don't, who's, I, everybody says it. So many people have said it. Like you cannot out supplement a bad diet and like, it doesn't matter what you build on top of a shaky foundation. It's not going to stay. It's not right. going to. Yeah. So I, I totally get that. I'm totally, I'm right there with you. Um, and I, I, I think I agree that like, if they're already on a fresh food diet that, I, I I had to, um, it's been a couple of months now, but I had to text Aunt Angela Ardolino and I was like, oh crap, I'm scared. <laughs> I oh. just took on, I just took on a client who has been working with Dr. Margot Roman <laughs> and I'm like, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, but see, you have a different perspective. You know, and what Dr. Roman does is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another person who relinquished her license and feels better for it. Um, you come from a different perspective. And, and sometimes it's just what's needed. Everybody's body is different. If it were one size fits all, yeah. there would be one pet food company and everything would be perfect. Right. <laughs> perfect is but right and even yeah. you and i we may both look fit but what takes it to make your body look fit and feel good is different than what my body looks fit and feels good with and they're both right and you got to figure it out for you and i got to figure it out for me and then we have to figure out and look at our dog and go whoa what's gonna work there and ooh, that didn't work and you yeah. know yeah yeah well absolutely I, I I love um the way you say that because we are all individuals our pets are all individuals and there is so much value in different perspectives and having seen different things and worked with different animals and different people and different modalities and um which is also one of the reasons why I love the healthy pet space so much because most people in it are just so willing to help each other and like give advice and well this happened when I did this with this dog and you know like there's so many of us that do love to share this information so that we all can be better at what we do and it's 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 beautiful but um I'm glad that you are still out there helping pet parents helping pets um because it doesn't How do I want to say this? Our veterinarians are so important, but I feel like we rely on them for way too much. 
And that's not fair to them or us, it, like in the long run, you know? And so having, you know, one, one person probably isn't going to see one kind of doctor their entire life. Mm -hmm. There are so many different specialties and so many different um, things that, that they need different perspectives on from people who have different types of training. And we haven't seen that in veterinary medicine for a really long time. And there are like different offshoots that are like oncologists and things like that that are happening. But um, it's just, a, it's that shift in the brain, right? That this isn't Absolutely. my everything. <laughs> Very diplomatically stated. <laughs> well done. I, yeah, it's, it's tough because I don't want to be a basher so that I don't get bashed. And, and I, I done the journey from where I was when I graduated from vet school. I would never have thought that I'd be in the land of voodoo and representing fresh pet food. My master's degree was about salmonella in the veterinary teaching hospital in horses. And holy cow, I was like, wow, salmonella, raw dog food, it's going to kill you. And I have just received so much education. And, and it's clients have taught me things and we got to be open to that. And what I had, I guess, because I had clients who would talk to me and I hope I listened at least part of the time. I, I know I didn't all the time. I'm guilty. Um, but we can all grow. And I guess I'm trying to be as diplomatic as <laughs> you are in saying that pet owners are smart parents. They have capability of thinking. They should believe in themselves. I find a lot of people have been scared by mainstream so that they lose their ability to think. Um, the littlest thing happens and they move into the emotional panic that if the exact same thing happened in a two-legged, like their husband, they'd be like, oh, I know what to do, but it happens in the dog or the kid and it creates panic and rushing to the doctor. I'm like, but you know how to do this. And I'd love to see more people have that ability and the comfort to ask questions, they deserve it. They, they, they have brains too. Yeah. So. Well, and I think one of like the, the like low hanging fruit of examples of this is diarrhea in a dog. Like Please don't how... rush to the ER simply because your dog has diarrhea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I yes yes this. I text with my clients a lot and they, oh, there's Calvin and they <laughs> often go, here's diarrhea. Do I need to go to the ER? And I'm like, please, please don't go. Hold on. How are we feeling? Oh, perky. Okay. Don't go to the ER. Yeah. Stop spending your money. Well, yes, it is your money. <laughs> it's, it's your money. It's your anxiety. It's also time, time. that that veterinarian needs for like, actual sick animals mm -hmm. and it's 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 like a lose-lose when our pet parents aren't educated when they don't have any sort of empowerment to help their pets at all right. which is where so many pet parents live right which is the space that you and i are in trying to create the empowerment or simply being the coach to say you know what you're doing i cannot tell you how many well, okay, let's be real. Most people who have pets have children. Mm -hmm. You haven't killed your two-legged child. You're <laughs> not going to kill your four-legged child. But they're terrified that if one bite of food isn't 100% complete and balanced, their dog or their cat's going to die. But you never once balanced your kid's diet 100% and complete. And they didn't die. <laughs> yeah. You can do this. We can do this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Complete and balanced. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad Ladies. you said that. I, well, and here's, okay. Having a certification in canine nutrition, having a certification as being a pet health coach 
personally, I feel like, and probably because I'm so new at this, I absolutely have clients that I'm like, look, you know what you're doing. You have been doing this for so long. You've been feeding fresh food for so long. I'm going to tell you, feed XYZ and XYZ and rotate and rotate and rotate, and your dog is going to be good. Can any one of these meals meet AFCO minimum requirements? No. But your dog, you're going to rotate and you're going to be good because I know the kind of pet parent you are. But then I also have these pet parents that are just like, I need a recipe and it needs to be balanced and blah, blah, blah. And like, I feel this responsibility that what I put out in the world needs to meet AFCO standards. And I hate that, but also like not being a veterinarian, not be like, I, I feel like I have this added like level of scrutiny. <laughs> Right. So who told you that you have to meet AFCO standards? Nobody. Me. AFCO. AFCO. <laughs> AFCO. AFCO has worked for 20 years. Because I remember when I graduated vet school, uh, we get all these free magazines. And it was the cover of multiple magazines that it said that what's the one question that veterinarians don't ask their pet owners? In 2000, 2001, we never talked about food. We didn't ask, mm -hmm. what are you feeding? And that focus on feeding created 20 years of education. So marketing. So 20 years of marketing, education, and training by AFCO, the pet food companies, to veterinarians now has everybody saying that your minimum standard for good nutrition is to meet AFCO standards. AFCO standards aren't bad. They're designed for kibble, mm -hmm. kibble and canned. Yeah. When most of the studies were done for the National Resource Council that the AFCO then based their standards on, um, it was based on this dead piece of kibble that had nothing in it except for 15 different levels of cobalt. Okay, which level of cobalt is enough to pre create mm -hmm. the minimum standard of health? Okay, there's your cobalt value. Now you have that same dead piece of kibble and now we're gonna look at manganese. What's your minimum standard? What's your toxic level? What's your not enough level? And that's where most of that information came from. So it's a beautiful guideline, but could you imagine if the US RDA were a do or die, the buck stops here? No, it's recommended. It's changed to the lobby groups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people f mistake the public mistakenly think that AFCO as an organization regulates pet food. They write a standard. The states declare each law in every state has a different standard. And it's very frustrating for pet food manufacturers. But AFCO standards are a guideline. They're a suggestion. So, uh, yes, thank you for saying that. And it is that like standard that like you said has been like pushed and pushed and pushed and people are like oh it has to be afco it has to be afco complete and balance and i'm th this is also why i'm so glad that you did create the next gen pet i'm gonna get it right i want to get it right i want to get it right <laughs> next gen i want to find it somewhere just, I want to say next gen, but I want to know if people want people to actually know what it is. Manufacturers Association. There we go. <laughs> NGPFMA. <laughs> because it doesn't like to the the most simplest way I know how to say it is like it's not a fair standard for fresh food, in my opinion. There isn't another standard that we can go by. But so, like, some have progress. You bought the book. I haven't you bought, bought the, book. the AFCO book and read it. It's so intimidating. I have not. <laughs> okay, good. Don't waste your money. Um, 
it's kind of torture. And I, after I've been going to AFCO meetings for 10 years, I'm still finding things in there that maybe I found it two years ago and then I forgot. It's like, oh, there's that. So there are a couple of mechanisms by which a manufacturer can declare itself complete and balanced. Do you know what all those mechanisms are? Well, one of the, you can have the food tested for nutrients. And you can do a really, really insanely small, short period of time feeding trial. Is that the two or there more? You can balance it on a piece of paper. Okay. You can send it into the lab, uh, which kind of just confirms your piece of paper. You can do a feeding trial and you can do what's called a family of foods so that if this this food looks like that food and this food's complete and balanced, then this one's complete and balanced and the family thing works. But right, the feeding trial, eight dogs or cats, six have to finish the study, six months long, and they measure five or six things, hematocrit, alkaline phosphatase, it's it's five or six numbers. It is not a complete chemistry. It is not a complete blood count. They simply have to maintain their body weight, not die Mm -hmm. of food related. And that's complete and balanced. So does that not give strength to the idea that the way that I feed my daughter might work for feeding my dog? Mm-hmm. Especially yeah. I have main dogs. <laughs> I have a feeding trail in my kitchen. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, for six months, you, six months, that's it. you that's could not very long. absolutely feed mm-hmm. some really random stuff. <laughs> right. And, right. And healthy animals would do fine. And so would healthy people. Mm-hmm. If all I ate were uh, Cheetos, you would notice at the end of six months. Um. But a little bit of variety, you wouldn't notice at the end of six months. So it's very interesting. So yes, you you do, you get it. And and the other thing that's a little bit confusing, what we're finding out in the industry is this all life stages food is probably not doing the pet owner or the pet a service Mm -hmm. because that. AFCO standard for puppies is a lot more vitamins and minerals than for sedentary adults. Mm-hmm. So much so that if I, if I make a food that could feed puppies, adults, old dogs, pregnant lactating females, if I have enough vitamins and minerals for all of them, it's too many vitamins and minerals for the old dogs. Mm-hmm. And too many calories, which is why when it says on the bag, oh, you should feed three cups and you're like, my dog's fat. I'm giving him a half a cup and he's still fat. It's because it's too many nutrients. And what we're starting to realize is nobody is served by that. And we should have puppy food. We should have agility dog food. We should have couch potato food. We should have, I don't move except to go to the bathroom food. (laughs) But the pet food companies don't like that because they want to get you and keep you for the life of your pet. And they think that the way to do that is by having the same food do every life stage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it does them service. I I think that we're, we're, we're absolutely realizing make niches, separate it out, educate people to understand your puppy has different requirements as a chihuahua than a Great Dane puppy, than as an adult, than a dog that does fly ball, you know, in in the same in cats, your massive Maine Coon that goes outside and hunts versus the domestic short hair that lays around on the couch huge variation yeah yes and we 
if we do feed fresh a fresh food diet, we have a lot more control mm -hmm. over that. Especially, I mean, a fresh food diet that is completely balanced with fresh foods. Like we're not adding right. all these synthetics. You've played with the spreadsheet and you put in the different activity levels and the weight mm -hmm. and the age of the animal. It's dramatic. The difference in the vitamins and minerals calories are calories everybody you know if you weigh 50 pounds and you exercise this much you need this many calories but you're going to need different amounts of vitamins and minerals it, it's it's fascinating isn't it it is yeah. it, it is yeah it really is and obviously so much more than um i ever put into the thought of my food which brings yes. me back to <laughs> Yeah, which brings me back to why is it so complicated? Why are we making this so complicated? <laughs> fear. It's yeah. fear. Because, you know, we have a responsibility. And, and this is what you've said. You're worried because liability and responsibility. If somebody reaches out to you or to me, now you and I are partially responsible for the recommendation that we made for health. And if there's a health problem, <gasps> Was it something that we did wrong in the recipe? And you go back to the recipe and yeah, I have, I have this lovely client who by the time she brought home the German shepherd puppy, he was already having horrible intestinal issues and I balanced a diet for her and he had pathologic fractures of a couple of different bones by the time he was six or eight months old. And I went, did I do something wrong? And I went back to the numbers and I quizzed her and I made sure. And I'm like, oh. but we already knew before she even brought him home, but you still worry. And oh yeah, the, the response. And that's why the responsibility is huge because the animal can't say my hip bone hurts. I don't think I'm eating enough uh, calcium. Yeah. Yeah. So very true. And that, you know, is, is a little bit different than um, when these smaller pet food companies are making fresh food diets commercially for our animals. And that's where NextGen is coming in to support these companies because they are doing it for like a mass audience. They're, 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 feeding, they're feeding the world, right? Like yeah. we're feeding one animal they're feeding the world. Um, and so there is, there, there's a lot of, in my mind, the way I see it, there's a lot of space that is missing <laughs> for fresh food in pet food regulation. And so is that, can you tell me a little bit about why NextGen is there? What's the point? What's what are you there for? Nobody represented fresh pet food manufacturers at AFCO meetings before I started the trade association. So before I started the trade association, 500 people would go to the AFCO meeting. Well, they, they all represent kibble, canned food, and nobody was talking about, well, Where's the law for fresh food? You know, who represents that? And so because it's, you know, kind of a lobby organization, basically, that's why there was an opening for me to come in. It was really funny. They, they interviewed me and I had to prove that I was a 501c3 and I had to prove that I had members. And who are your members? I'm like, I'm not telling you who my members are. Because initially my members didn't want to come out of the closet. They're like, oh my God, we have a bullseye on our back. We don't want anybody to know. I said, that's cool. I got your back. Uh, but but now I have a group of manufacturers who still don't want to tell. And then I have a group of manufacturers who are like, yes, I'm a proud member of NextGen yeah. because what do we do now? So now... Okay, here's an example. Do you know that until eight months ago, freeze dried was not a defined pet food process. Did not know. And you think, okay, how boring we got to define it. But if it's not defined, then how do the regulators regulate it? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of freeze dried food on the shelf, but it's not defined as a 
food process, so how do they regulate it? Because they're, each state has regulators and they take food off the shelf and they sample it and whatever. You know, in the raw pet food space, one of the pathogen control methods is HPP, high pressure processing. It's also called high pressure pasteurization. It's not defined. Yeah, interesting. Both the freeze drying process and the HPP process, I, I've talked to Billy about on the show, and he has said for both, like, different manufacturers do it differently. They do it differently. Right. And so I'm proud to say I got freeze dried defined. And I'm frustrated to say we are working through HPP. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be an education process because when I first proposed the definition for HPP, I had some regulators say, I never heard of that for pet food. Hmm. Like, what? You never heard of that? Yeah. They never heard of it. They never stopped and, and thought about it. And then I had some regulators argue what the last P stands for. Is it processing? Is it pasteurization? And then we had to define pasteurization and pasteurization is already defined mm -hmm. by, by Congress and as applied to milk and juice. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we have a stepwise process. So it's an education process, which is fine. And it's interesting. And so this is our choice as an industry. Our choice as an industry is to not participate not participate with AFCO or to engage with AFCO and say, okay, hey guys, here's us over here, the little 10 to 15% of the marketplace and we're growing. So let's start talking about things and defining things. And even though sometimes I get ornery in the meetings, <laughs> for the most part, it's... <laughs> The people, the people who are there, the regulators, they're good people. They're nice people. They're just trained in the box in which they're trained. And that's our job as a trade association is to say, hey, expand your box. Yeah. Consider this. Look at something else. So we're working on HPP as a process to define now. It's, we'll get there. Yeah. Well, yes, exactly what you just said. It's it's if you don't participate at some point, like because this segment of the market isn't going anywhere, that it's it's getting bigger, and some of the big pet food companies are realizing that and trying to dabble and figure out how they can remarket and make it seem like blah blah blah. Yeah. If 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 you don't participate then it's all up to them. And if, is that what you want? Right. And obviously the answer is no, because you stepped up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. So the meetings are absolute pure torture. <laughs> Any meeting is always torture. Um, but slowly with baby steps, we're making progress. That's wonderful to hear. And I'm glad. Thank you. Thank well, you thank for you. stepping up. <laughs> and, well, yeah. I mean, I know, like I said, people, e even in the, the healthy pet space, don't know this exists. And there is so much talk of how are we going to do this? How is this going to be pushed forward? How, 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 how? And they don't even know that this is, is existing. So here we are. Here you are. This is what's going on. <laughs> Progress is being made, regardless of how slow, it's still yeah, progress, it's and that's important. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you for that. How the average, the average pet parent, or I say the average pet parent, but the reality is the pet parents that listen to me are more of the 2.0 pet parents, if, if mm -hmm. you know. They, one, say somebody wants to work with you, do you, are you taking on new clients? How do people find you? Okay. Two ways to get a hold of me. Okay. Uh, when it comes to pet food, it's ngpfma.org. That's the trade association. 
Um, so if it's anybody who makes fresh pet food, they should be a member. Well, they should. Um, <laughs> and then that my, my other hat is healthy possibilities with a paw, the dog paw, um, dot com. And so, yes, I'm a health coach. I see people in person. I do virtual or phone consults. I can help people balance diets just like you work on. I help people with the next step after they've gotten their balanced diet and things still aren't right. And I suggest, okay, have your vet do this. Have your vet try that. Have you looked at this? Um, so there are two ways, two ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. And then, so with Next Gen, is there anything that pet parents can do to support? We have... Uh, it, it's kind of a little bit buried in the website. So you go to Next Gen, you go to About Us, and there's the page that lists those members who felt comfortable saying that they're members. Mm -hmm. Support those companies. You know, those are the companies who are forward thinking and do want to look at stepping up, changing the industry. You know, there's a new, AFCO has recently started what's called the Common Food Index. It's a listing of common food because you have that giant AFCO manual of like 700 pages where they're defining meat and bone meal and corn gluten meal and soybean extract meal and whatever. But how about sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes aren't defined. Sweet potatoes would be considered a common food item. And so AFCO has started this common food index where they list. And so they have a committee um, and it's this 20 question thing. I, I've been asked by our members. I've submitted like 20 different food items and some of the foods have come back and they said, no, because the problem is, is that with common food index, it has to be good for every single species. And if a horse can't eat a chestnut, then it's not good for every species. But they're still thinking about nettles. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Some species can't eat chestnuts. So they told me no, but whatever. We need to come back. But then that's how we get the different kinds of mushrooms approved. Because before the common food index, the only thing a manufacturer was allowed to say was mushrooms in the ingredient list. Well, now they can say button mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms. I just applied for mitake mushrooms. I haven't heard yet. Um, so, you know, because those are different. It's different. Yeah. That's how we communicate. So the manufacturers who are on that list, that's a subset of my members for exactly those reasons. And if your manufacturer isn't on the list, it would be great for you to tell them that they need to come join next gen because we have strength in numbers. Pet Food in Institute, PFI, is very successful because even though Purina and Blue Buffalo have had huge battles, they work together at PFI, representing their companies at AFCO, to FDA, to Congress, through PFI. And that's what we do in the trade association is you can consider that company to be your competitor. They're not. Everybody has a slightly different niche. And how about we collaborate and together let's advance the industry and you got to do it as a group. You got to mm -hmm. do it as a group. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for everything you do and for coming on the show and talking. My pleasure. To yeah, this was fun and very informative, educational. I love that. And yeah, so guys, check out, tell me your website one more time for um, consults. Next gen? For, sorry, or, which one? The consults. Uh, healthypossibilities.com, P-A-W-S-I-D-I-L-I-T-I-E-S. I put a lot of I's in there, but it was a really cute name. <laughs> <laughs> healthy possibilities possibilities and yeah when people go there you get a pop-up for a free report that's a free report of how you're overpaying your vet and over vaccinating your pet 
it's kind of a, it's an intro to my philosophy about let's start asking ourselves questions. Do we really need to do everything, every service that is being recommended? Yeah, right. Mm, so very important. Thank you for that. And thank you for being here, Dr. My pleasure. <laughs>